Two eyewitnesses said they saw a man in a pickup truck deliberately run over another man, not once, but twice. Police could not find the victim's body or the pickup truck. And when police tried to talk to the two eyewitnesses, they had disappeared too. All police could find were some blood stains in the snow. But would this be enough to prove murder? On January 29, 2001, a member of a motorcycle gang in Duluth, Minnesota, called police to report his roommate, 27-year-old Eric Schriefer, missing. He said he hadn't seen Schriefer for the last four days, and he was worried. Usually, that doesn't happen. People that report missing persons usually call in within the first six to eight hours in a panic. Well, great. I appreciate your assistance. Have a good day. Officer Ryan Temple was assigned to the case. Hi, this is Officer Temple. I attempted to contact all the area hospitals, all the county jails in the area, the Duluth Detoxification Center. Also tried to contact the victim's family, his mother, his father, also his employer. No one had heard from Eric Schriefer. He worked as an apprentice for the Boilermakers Union 647. Eric was very quiet and reserved um, very good performance on the job site. But he hadn't been to work either. Police found Schriefer's three automobiles still in his driveway. His wallet and winter coat were inside his house. Police discovered that Schriefer was last seen at a party in a motorcycle clubhouse. Two motorcycle club members who were at that party, Charlie Johnson and Herbert Zingel, said that Schriefer got into an altercation with Joseph Weymann, a member of a rival motorcycle club. The two were separated and escorted outside. Where the fight resumed. The witnesses say Waymanen easily won the fight. While Schriefer was still on the ground, Waymanen did the unthinkable. He got into his truck, started the engine, and intentionally ran over Schriefer. Amazingly, he wasn't killed. Waymanen then put his truck in reverse and ran over him a second time. Fearing for their own safety, the witnesses ran back inside. When they looked out again, both the truck and Schriefer were gone. There was something more to this story than just a missing person. The witnesses admitted they were drinking heavily that night and weren't sure of all the details. And the alleged fight took place almost a week earlier, and the inclement weather complicated the investigation. There was a four-day time lapse, and we had received approximately eight inches of slushy snow in, be in between time. Uh, it made it a very difficult crime scene. Uh, there was, once we got there, there wasn't a whole lot to see to start with. When police looked into Joseph Weymanen's background, 
they discovered he had never been in trouble with the law. He was an ex-Marine who had served during the Gulf War and was a member of the Thunderbird Motorcycle Gang, although not an active member. Investigators needed to find some forensic evidence to corroborate the witness's story. Police wanted to find some way to verify the claims of two eyewitnesses that Eric Schriefer was run over twice by Joseph Weymann in his truck. From the very beginning, we had to try and put the case together to understand exactly what had happened and then uh, attempt to try and locate where possibly the body had gone to after that period of time. So initially, we were trying to put the puzzle together before we could find out where the body may have gone to. Police set up a command post in the alley where the fight allegedly took place. Working in sub-zero temperatures, officers uncovered the top layer of new snow in order to search for blood. They were successful. They discovered a blood trail that led from the alley all the way to the end of a parking area nearly 80 yards away. At the end of the trail, police found one very large pool of blood in the snow. Due to the amount of blood that we found in that one spot and the fact that there was no blood after that as we continued to excavate the snow past that point, we believe the body was loaded into the truck. Medical examiner Dr. Donald Cundall was called to the scene. A person to produce that much blood in one localized area had to still have their heart beating. They may uh, have suffered serious injuries, but uh, their heart had to steer, still be beating in order to uh, produce that much blood coming from a wound. Once the heart stops beating, a body no longer bleeds. The blood evidence suggested that the victim was lodged under the truck and was dragged 80 yards. The pool of blood at the end of the trail indicated the victim was still alive and had been picked up from the snow. However, Dr. Cundall told police that without immediate medical attention, the victim would have died within four hours. To collect the blood evidence, police used a standard coffee filter to separate the blood from the snow. The filter trapped the red and white blood cells and allowed plasma and melting snow to drip through just as the filter traps coffee grounds, not allowing them to drip into the coffee. Without a body, police had another problem, how to tell whether this was the blood of Eric Schriefer. But police got a break. They learned that Schriefer had undergone hand surgery a few years earlier when he had accidentally shot himself. The hospital saved Schriefer's tissue sample that had been sent to the pathology lab for analysis. So you're getting a whole section. The tissue was preserved in paraffin, which halts the degenerative process, preserving the tissue indefinitely. The blood DNA found in the snow was compared to the DNA from Schriefer's tissue sample. It matched. Police canvassed area hospitals, health clinics, and doctor's offices. No one with the type of injury Schriefer would have sustained had been treated. Convinced that Eric Schriefer could not have survived without treatment, the medical examiner signed a death certificate. Yes, we do have a homicide, and one of the worst types for a detective to have, a homicide without a body. The next step was for police to speak with the driver of the truck, Joseph Weymanen, but he was uncooperative. He started to shut the door on me. At that point, I reached over and grabbed him by the shirt, informed him that he was under arrest for murder. Police impounded Weymanen's vehicle, but a forensic analysis found no evidence of an accident. They found no trace of blood 
body, fluids, or hair anywhere on the truck or underneath. The crime lab is well respected by law enforcement agencies in this state. They've got the best equipment, the most sophisticated gear. And if they couldn't find any evidence in the truck, then you started wondering, well, how could that be? How could somebody drive a truck over somebody twice and there's no hair, no blood, nothing? And um, that didn't seem right to me. The lack of forensic evidence wasn't the only problem. Witnesses' credibility was another. During police questioning, both witnesses admitted they were inebriated at the time of the alleged accident. One said, quote, I don't remember who was at the house, who came back. We were sitting there drinking. I know there was people in and out. Like I say, I'm drunk. I stay drunk as I can. And Joseph Weymanen maintained his innocence. With two inebriated eyewitnesses, no forensic evidence in Weymanen's truck, and no body to prove there had been a murder, prosecutors knew they didn't have enough evidence to go to trial. Investigators needed more evidence in the Eric Schriefer case, and the search for his body intensified. Police decided to find out how their prime suspect, Joseph Weymanen, spent his leisure time and with whom. I came across one of his friends and asked, when's the last time you'd spent time with Weymanen? Where was that that he spent the time with him and it came to be that uh, within the week previous he was ice fishing with this friend? Police had a general description of the ice house that Weymanen and his friend used, but they weren't sure where it was located on the vast St. Louis River. Nevertheless, police were assigned to search the area. He came across an ice house. We weren't quite sure whether it was the one that we were necessarily looking for, but as he was looking into the ice house, he found a hole that was larger than your normal ice fishing hole probably the size of one that a human could be slipped into. An underwater dive team searched the frigid waters of the St. Louis River for Schriefer's body. Conditions were miserable. It was snowing with wind gusts up to 30 miles per hour. Divers could stay under the freezing water for only 30 to 45 minutes before suffering hypothermia. After days of searching, they found nothing. Then investigators got more bad news. Their case against Weymanen was based almost entirely on the testimony of two eyewitnesses who claimed they saw a fight between Schriefer and Weymanen. But when police went to question them further, the two had vanished. We have actually documented testimony from family members of the two witnesses that the Thunderbirds were approached by the Hells Angels and in turn approached the two witnesses and asked them to leave the community. Donroy threatened them. With no body, no forensic evidence against Wayman, and, and now no witnesses, the defense filed a motion to dismiss the case. The prosecution was in a difficult position. All the while, too, we are looking for the body. And we're looking for some more physical evidence to tie Joe Wayman into this. We were convinced that he was the person responsible for the death, but he wasn't saying anything. The more police thought about Wayman and truck and the eyewitness testimony, the more they realized how unlikely it was that the undercarriage of his truck would be so clean, especially in the middle of winter. In the words of investigators, it was almost too clean. So nearly six months after the murder, they examined the truck once again. We decided we would take the truck apart piece by piece until we were satisfied that there was no evidence to be found or we actually found evidence. And that's what we did. We had a belief all along that uh, if the truck was used in transport of the body, uh, there always has to be some type of forensic evidence that's left behind 
or, or in any kind of crime scene. I, I strongly believe that there's always forensic evidence that's left behind in any crime scene. They hoisted Waymanen's truck up on a rack in the police garage, and bolt by bolt, they took the truck apart. I think I used the analogy in one of my stories. It was like uh, they were cutting their lawn with tweezers. They went over that vehicle inch by inch. For over two days, police searched every inch of the vehicle. Finally, they found their first piece of evidence, a single strand of human hair that was attached to the front spring of the truck. And when they removed the top covering of the truck's cargo area, they found several small blood stains in the crevices. Police now suspected that Waymanen power sprayed his truck after the murder, and the water pushed the victim's blood into the tiny crevices between the sheets of metal. But scientists still needed to find out who the blood and hair belonged to. When police found blood stains and a strand of hair in the undercarriage of Joseph Waymanen's truck, they promptly informed Waymanen's attorney that they would be sending the materials for forensic testing. Once the state could tie uh, the body uh, to Mr. Waymanen's truck, uh, the case uh, uh, changed dramatically. And I talked to Joe and I, and I told him so. Ultimately, it comes down to the old Kenny Rogers song. You gotta know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And I felt it was, uh, when they found that blood in the truck, it was time to fold them. Without even waiting for the results of the forensic testing, Waymanen agreed to lead police to Schriefer's body in return for a reduced charge of unintentional second degree murder. The prosecution agreed and Waymanen confessed. It's my opinion that this forensic evidence was so powerful that Mr. Waymanen knew what the outcome would be when we sent it to the lab and just decided to plead guilty. In Waymanen's tape confession, his version differed from the eyewitnesses. I was panicking, I was in a state of shock. I knew all of this was gonna come out eventually. I figured I was gonna be going to prison. I was angry with him. Waymanen admitted running over Schriefer in the alley, but said it was an accident. He also said he didn't realize Schriefer was stuck under the truck until he reached the end of the parking lot. Waymanen said he put Schriefer in the back of his truck and dumped him into the river the next day. He said the police had searched the correct spot in the St. Louis River, but the body may have drifted. When the divers returned for a second search, they still couldn't find the body. A few weeks later, after the plea agreement was signed, Schriefer's body surfaced by itself on the Wisconsin side of the river. The autopsy revealed that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. In Waymanen's mother's garage, police found a cinder block. Its size and shape are consistent with Schriefer's head injury. Waymanen didn't deny striking Schriefer in the head with the block, but said he did it after Schriefer was already dead. Prosecutors were skeptical. He says he hit him with a block when he was wrapping up his body at his mother's garage and hit, hit him with a block of uh, cement just out of frustration, expressing an anger at Eric Schriefer for having caused him to do this. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Because of the plea agreement, Joseph Waymanen was sentenced to 12 and a half years in prison for Eric Schriefer's death. He'll be eligible for parole after eight years. 12 years in prison for a murder where you drive your vehicle 
over a body one time, then back over it again, if the witnesses are to be believed, to me, that's not justice. The family wanted us to make some type of negotiation, compromise on the amount of time, and uh, in return for recovery of the body. And I remember even telling uh, Eric's mom and dad and brother that Joe Wayman is not going to get what he deserves for what he did to Eric. I made that very clear to them, and that's what I even told the court at sentencing. But uh, we were willing to make a compromise in order to recover the body and put the case behind. The other reason for the deal was the disappearance of the two eyewitnesses. They are still missing to this day. I hope they are OK. I hope nothing has happened to them. And if we can find out who is responsible for their disappearance, for their being conveniently absent at a time when we needed them, for us having to reduce the charge from murder in the second degree intentional murder down to unintentional, we want to know. Then there'll be a little bit of finality to this case. The case was solved by forensic evidence Waymanen couldn't power wash away. Waymanen knew that the blood found in the metal crevices and the single strand of hair were Schrieffer's, and that forensic testing would prove it. I strongly believe that there's always forensic evidence that's left behind in any crime scene. It's just a matter of your human eye picking up and looking in certain places and using the current technologies to locate that forensic evidence. Forensic science was remarkable because without the police department going that extra distance and finding that evidence in the truck, in the tailgate, in the undercarriage, without the medical examiner finding that blood sample with the matching DNA at the end of that alley, we would have been out of luck. <laughs>